The U.S. House of Representatives is scheduled to take up the $33 million crime bill. Last night, the House Rules Committee finished its work on the measure as members negotiated the ground rules for the floor debate. Among the crime bill's provisions, money for new police officers and new prisons, and a ban on 19 so-called assault weapons. Next, we'll show you the Rules Committee meeting, which runs about an hour and 20 minutes. The committee is chaired by Democratic Representative Joe Moakley of Massachusetts. The Rules Committee will now come to order. We're meeting tonight to grant the long-awaited rule for the conference report to accompany H.R. 3355, the Violent Crime and Control Law Enforcement Act, the largest federal attack on crime in history. The American people have waited a long time for this bill also. Members of the Rules Committee have waited a long time for this bill. And I'm happy that it's time is finally here with 100,000 new police officers, assault weapons, and creative new prevention programs. The crime bill we are considering is going to make real differences in people's lives. Life in the United States is not what it used to be. At one time, you could walk out of your home and only have to worry about the weather. You had enough money for ice cream, and I miss those days, and I hope this bill will help bring them back. I would like to recognize the ranking minority member who feels so strongly about this bill, Mr. Solomon. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I really do appreciate your, uh, your recognizing me, but uh, the bill is missing. And uh, I know uh, one copy of it was... Uh, I'm You've gonna, had a copy. I'm, I'm going to say that. All right. Uh, one copy of it uh, was presented by Chairman Brooks to the... Uh, House of Representatives on the floor a little earlier, at which time Mr. Brooks said there would be many copies up here uh, within several minutes. Uh, we came up here and we were waiting for the several copies and uh, your staff, which is a very good staff, I might add, uh, was uh, desperately printing uh, one additional copy because you only received just the one copy of a uh, of a uh, bill, of a conference report that is over a foot thick, I believe. At least it looked that way. Uh, we were at 737 given a copy, and uh, I gave my copy immediately to, of all people, the uh, ranking, or rather the uh, Republican staff of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the Republican members were a part of the conference, but had never seen the conference because the conference uh, report was put together uh, in a partisan manner, and they had never seen it. So, so that we could begin to uh, to analyze that foot thick conference report, we gave our copy. So consequently, now here we sit with no copy, and uh, I know your staff is again desperately making a third copy, which uh, no doubt they will bring out here in just a few minutes. I hope. Um, well, I, if it's, I, I would like to see it because... Uh, well, if the gentleman wants more time, we'll just recess until you feel that you've had enough time to look at it. Well, we might, we might need to do that. All but right, uh, but fine. just, just uh, looking at the, the index that is in, uh, in our folder, this index Mr. ends Chairman. with uh, title He's got the 30... Oh, okay. okay. Uh, the, uh, the index ends with title 30 with sec section 3... 30003, which I understand is, is not the end of the, uh, of the report. There have been a, a lot of other additional items that were added in, uh, in another section that is not, uh, not indexed here. Uh, consequently, uh, we just feel very uncomfortable with this. I, I am going to, uh, to make a motion in, in a few minutes. Uh, let me just say that this committee is being asked to waive all points of order against the conference report that it has not seen and had a chance to, to analyze. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if we waive all points of order, it is unlikely that members of the House, I'm talking about 435 members now, will ever see the conference report before they vote on it, since this, this does waive the three-day layover requirement for conference reports. Now, here is, a, here is a $33 billion bill, and members of this House are going to vote on it, and there is no way that they're ever going to have uh, not even a opportunity, much less an ample opportunity to take a look at it. Uh, we've never been given an explanation by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee 
uh, Mr. Brooks, who is a very good friend of mine and yours, uh, or anybody else about what kind of rules violations are involved in this conference report that we're going to, uh, going to see in a few minutes. And judging from the last summary I saw before this was reopened and renegotiated, this conference report may very well be larded with even more budget busting pork. Uh, I understand there was a lot of horse trading going on to get the votes for this rule, so we might, uh, we might even have some pigs and horses besides just pork in this thing. I, I don't know. But well, if you let, didn't let, give your copy away, we'd know. Well, the, the, well, I don't think we would know because we, we wouldn't have time to look for it. But let me just say in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, that this is no way to run a Congress, and it's certainly no way to enact what is billed as a major piece of crime legislation. And I really do think we ought to, whatever we do, if we, if we do put out this rule this, this evening uh, at uh, 8.15, uh, I hope this bill does not come on the floor tomorrow morning. Because, again, I just want to reemphasize re that members are not going to have any idea what's in this bill. They're not going to have any idea what rules uh, they're waiving. And that is not right to ask any member, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, to vote for something like this without having the opportunity to analyze it and let the American people know what we're, what we're voting on. So having said all that... Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Um, Derek, but, um, Butler Derek. Well... That's uh, right. <laughs> 16 years, Mr. Chairman. Still, still, still going on. I get it but right. I but I remember your face. <laughs> 16 years. You know, l let me reply to your uh, remarks, Mr. Solomon, and, and you know, I, I certainly appreciate the fact that, you know, we would all like to have all legislation months before to read every word, dot every I. But the fact of the matter is that we have had this legislation for a long time. A long time. If, if you will, if there's anyone in this house that has any particular interest in the crime bill, that doesn't know what's in it, or just, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And, and I, just, I just think it's unfair to mislead uh, anyone who might be watching this uh, 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 meeting here into thinking that uh, all of a sudden you get some instrument that no one is aware of what's in it. As you well know, and, and I know, and everyone in this room knows, uh, that is not the case. There have been several minor changes, I'm told, that have been made in the conference report in the last week or two, but uh, it's been sitting around here and is available. We could have uh, all looked at it. Uh, you followed it. I know how much you are against crime and how much you believe in, uh, in, in, in this crime bill and putting 100,000 new officers on the streets and, I, uh, and, and protecting the people of, of, of this country. And I know with your great interest that you have certainly had an opportunity to read it. And so I think it's, you know, th this, is, this is, I think, a historic uh, moment in, 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 in this country and that this, this is a very significant <laughs> crime bill. One thing it does, it gets rid of these assault weapons, these things that people out in the streets and blood flows in, in every city and byways and highways uh, uh, of this country. Uh, it uh, puts 100,000 new policemen on, on, the, on the streets. The, uh, it, it does a multitude of things. It increases the death penalty in, 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 in many instances. It has a three strikes and you're out. Three strikes and, and you're in there for the, for the rest of your, of your life uh, of violent crimes. It uh, has provisions in there on violence against women. Uh, it has a, a provision uh, dealing with a rural crime. It, it has a, a provision with a repeat offender. It has provisions in there trying, trying juveniles as uh, adults, and those are just a few. And I think, you know, although I may not agree with everything in it, as you don't agree, but uh, I think it's a good piece of legislation. It's certainly something that, that needs to be uh, presented to the floor of the House and let them uh, uh, work their will on this conference report. They've already passed prime, uh, uh, approximately the, the same thing. Would my good friend yield? Not, not, not quite yet. I'll, I'll be glad to yield in, in just a moment. But I think to, uh, to try to, to, to ask people to believe that, uh, you know, that this is some sort of document that all of a sudden has plopped down on us here uh, this evening is uh, it's not exactly being 
Well, it's not exactly the case. Butler, I'd be glad to yield to Mr. Solomon. Well, well Butler, uh, you know, uh, first of all, you are retiring at the end of this year, and uh, you really are a very valuable member of this, not just this committee, but the, but, the, but the House. We don't agree on a lot of things, but we do agree on a lot of things. And one thing we agree on is, uh, is that we ought to have tough crime laws in this country to deal, with, uh, to deal with the number one issue in the eyes of the American people. But let me just say, you say that uh, uh, there are just a few little things that, that uh, might have been added. But we are waiving the rule on scope. Now, there are a lot of things that have been added in here that, that many of us are very, very concerned about. Uh, I, for one, uh, would like to vote for a, a tough crime bill. But I understand that uh, mandatory minimum sentences for those who commit crimes with guns, that, that that's been repealed in this bill. The language even on that was changed beyond what it was when we left. And I have no idea what that language is. I do know that we're repealing mandatory minimum sentences for people who commit crimes with guns, yet we are taking the guns away from law-abiding citizens. Now, that bothers me. Now, uh, my amendment, I had an amendment in this bill, which was a very, very controversial issue on the floor, and dealing with this three strikes and you're out, or three strikes or you're in for life. I had an amendment which uh, said that any one of those convictions could be if you were convicted of a, of a serious drug felony. Now that means pounds and pounds of marijuana, cocaine, etc. Any one of those could be counted as three strikes. I have no idea whether that's in the bill, and my Republican members that served on that uh, conference cannot tell me because they don't know. And that's why, and I could go on and on with a whole list of things, that is why members of this House need to have three days to look at this bill to see what is still in it and what is not in it and what has been added in it that wasn't there in the first place. That's only fair. So, Butler, I mean, I, I know that you're sincere in, uh, in what you say, but the truth of the matter is we aren't going to have time to analyze well, the bill. Well, let me... Uh, I, I don't let, have the let, time. Let me... Uh, I, I have the time. Let me... Uh, you know, uh, and then I'll, then, then I'll, uh, I'll uh, yield and, and, and be through with it. The point that, that I was making Mr. Solomon, is not the substance this way or that, but that, that, that it would take you probably about a half an hour to look at the changes, and the rest of it you already know about. So the point that I was making is to say that, that you don't have an opportunity to know what's in the bill is not the case. You've got very a able staff over there, and if they're not able enough, I have some staff that is able enough uh, to, uh, to, to tell you uh, the changes that have been made. There it is. Yeah, but you, you, you've had months to read it. You've had months to read it. You've had months to read it. Don't leave, don't make the people think that you just you don't know what's in there. Of course you do. You're too smart for that, Mr. Uh, I thank I thank uh, you. I thank my friend for yielding. And I, now Butler, you talked about a lot of very great uh, aspects of this bill. And when you refer to the hundred thousand police officers, I think it's very important for us to clarify what that consists of. In this bill, if the funding is actually provided, there will be. $14,700 per cop on the street. Now, the average cost for a police officer, if you include training and everything that uh, goes along with that, is $65,000 a year. So we're roughly talking about one quarter of that 100000 And the president has courageously referred to his goal of getting 100,000 officers on the street. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the bottom line figure that is going to be hopeful provided in this bill will end up with about one-fourth of what the, pre the president has promised. And that's the number we've been looking at for a long period of time. Another thing that concerns me greatly is when you listen to things that have come from administration officials. We just got this newspaper story this morning. The director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was in Buffalo and met with the editorial board of the Buffalo News. And their Sunrise Edition this morning had this story about the fact that this crime bill, maybe he's seen it, uh, maybe he's seen that conference report that we got at 737 this evening, but the fact of the matter is the president's appointed FBI chief has criticized this legislation, stating that if the funding is there, it's going to come from cuts in the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Agency. So it seems to me that while there are a lot of great sounding aspects of this, when you look at the details that we have been able to analyze, uh, really there are more than a few problems with it. And that's what has led, I believe, a majority of the, uh, of the institution to, uh, 
be very concerned about it, and I think that that's something we need to look at, and that's why we're not about to support well, it. Let, let me make one short statement, and then I'll yield I back the balance, uh, balance of my time. I've never heard of a federal agency that thought that they were going to get cut that didn't yell yet, so there's nothing new about that. Well, but you have to ask the question, as we look at dealing with the issue of crime, should the cuts come from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Drug Enforcement Agency? I mean, I think that if we're going to tackle crime, that that really is not the most responsible area for us to target. Well, to begin with, and Mr. Dry, we, I don't uh, operate and I don't vote on newspaper articles, and I'm sure you don't, and you don't know whether that's the case to begin with. Uh, I mean, all I, uh, this is a guy that I thinks that somebody may source. cut may cut Mr. some of his Mr. money. Chairman, this is what I used as my source, Butler. Uh, well, I, it was provided, and I don't use every news well, story. You, you 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 approach things in too much depth. I've known you for a long time. Too much depth <laughs> to base it on a newspaper. Mr. Chairman. Well, I wish we could have time it's to look at the time. depth of this conference report before we have a chance to vote on it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Quillen. I really don't want to be last. You don't want to be what? Last. Okay. We just so straighten that out. Thank you for yielding to Mr. Me. Quillen, could I <laughs> tell you a story before you start this? I'd be this glad story. to hear it. I have a great friend. Uh, how long is this played, story? Who played, who played football for, for West Point. And he and his buddies get together every year to, to talk about once a year and meet. And he comes back and he tells me, we all tell how well we've done. And I said, yeah. He said, yeah. he said, I've always done better than any of the rest of them. I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, how's that? He said, because I go last. Yeah. <laughs> so you can go well, last. Maybe that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Leo DeRocher didn't think that. But here we are at 8 o'clock plus this evening discussing something that's been in the hopper for six years. Well, that's the point you I know, just made. You know, the haste makes waste and... I don't understand the push. You think you have the votes on the Democrat side to pass this measure. I sincerely hope you don't. We can argue the merits. I'm against the social programs. I'm against the gun control provisions. I'm against the crime bill. But the boiling point of the whole argument is that we've waited six years and we're meeting here, it's 8.25, why the rush? Are you afraid some of your I votes in the rule are going to step away and fade away? Or do you feel like that if you delay it any longer, you're going to be farther behind? To me, I don't think that's the question. The question is, is this a good bill? Is it good for the country? Is it good for the people? Is it good for crime, crime control? I don't think so. We spend more billions, but what are we going to accomplish? I don't think we're going to accomplish anything. I think we're only shadow boxing. We're putting uh, uh, icing on the ice cream. If you call it vanilla, if you call it chocolate, whatever. But I don't think the crime bill before us is going to solve the problem of eliminating crime. I think the perception of the American people that the Democrats want to project is that it will. But it's going to be a quagmire. It's going to bring us down into the hole of no return. And I think we're just absolutely on the wrong track. That's Jim Quillen. I know that crime is a terrible problem throughout the country. I don't like to see young people murdered. I don't like to see crime ravaging communities. We all know that. But at the same time, what is the cure? The cure is not rushing this program to the House floor on the presumption you have the votes to pass it. It's not a political measure. It should be for the benefit of the American people in eliminating crime. I've been here for a long time. I've seen Republicans march up the aisle as partisans. 
I've seen Democrats march up the aisle as partisans, and I'm afraid that's what's going to happen in this case. Why aren't we Americans? Why aren't we doing the job for the American people instead of the partner partisanship that is displayed on the floor of the house? I can't believe what's happening in America today. Yes, the president wants a crime bill passed. And those who want it passed are jumping through the hook. But what is a crime bill going to do? It's going to establish social programs that are going to add to the deficit. We're going to ban assault weapons. And I don't favor any gun control in this nation of ours. It isn't the gun, it's the man that pulls the trigger, and that's not the way to cure our crime problem. Why favor those who want to put in amendments in the crime bill to satisfy their own district? That isn't the problem. The problem is can we solve our crime problem? We don't have to have a payoff. No, we don't. Would the gentleman yield for just a moment? No, I, 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 I want to yield, to... Butler, because sure. you're my friend and I'm going to miss you. But I want to know in my own heart that this is not a partisan issue that is for the benefit of the American people to eliminate crime. I'd be glad to yield. I was going to go. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be glad to yield. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. Dry that just reported uh, a statement by the FDI, FBI director. I have a, a, a statement here from the FBI director dated uh, August the 10th, 1994, which is today. It says, report in the Buffalo News today are statements by me characterized as criticism of the crime bill. To the contrary, I have said publicly that it would hurt the FBI if Congress does not enact this bill. If enacted, the crime bill will benefit law enforcement at every level. I feel as strongly today as I did last month when on Meet the Press, I said, and I quote, this is a very, very big bill and a very, very important bill, and my view of it is that we're going to be much better off with it than without it. My comments in the news today were part of a wide-ranging discussion about the need to uh, to fund federal law enforcement. The budget concerns I raised do not stem from the crime bill. In fact, the crime bill will provide additional funding to the FBI and other federal law enforcement agencies. Funding for law enforcement remains a serious issue of concern to me and other law enforcement leaders. I will continue to work with the Congress and the administration to maintain adequate funding for law enforcement in the months and years. Well, that's my the, uh, friend, Mr. That's Durkin, the head of the FBI. My, just a well, moment, I have the time. All right. Mr. Derrick, I appreciate your comment, Thank you. but I can see some political arm twisting. <laughs> and you know that, and I know that, and that's not right. If the FBI has the independence it should have, it should not uh, flip-flop, carry water on both shoulders. And I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate you, Butler Derrick, and, I appreciate and we're going to miss you. But I yielded to you, thinking you were going to comment on my remark. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I didn't no, say no. that. But uh, Mr. Dreyer is a valuable member of this committee. Thank you. And I don't want to divert the attention from my remarks to anybody else on this committee. And I'd be glad to yield to you, Mr. Durick, to comment on what I have said. Mr. Quillen, I hold you in the highest esteem, and I don't believe there's a whole lot that I disagree with you about except the gun issue and the fact that we need to pass the crime bill. Well, I don't I hold, agree I with hold, you. I, I think we ought to delay it, delay it. Six years is a long school. time to wait, I, I come and out we there can't and afford to rush it to the floor of the house. I'll come out there and campaign for you against you, whatever you want well, me to I'll do. I'll be glad to do that for you <laughs> if you decide to run again. Mr. Frost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, I think that it is, is worth noting that the, uh, the bill passed the Senate on November 19th of last year, passed the House on April 21st of this year. Uh, the, the conference report 
does not vary substantially from the bill passed by the House. And so uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle have, uh, of course, known what passed the House since uh, April 21st. It's, uh, it's interesting, too, that it is interesting to me that in the uh, 16 years that I've been here, every time uh, a crime bill is presented to Congress, there are always people who say it's not good enough, say it's not a perfect bill. Now, this bill is a tough bill. It has some other things in it that people on the other side of the aisle disagree with, but there are some pretty tough provisions in this bill. 60 new death penalty crimes. I support the death penalty. Some people on my side of the aisle do not support the death penalty. But this, has, this makes 60 new offenses subject to the death penalty. Uh, the three strikes and you're out provision that is popular in this country, something that people want, making sure that you commit three, if you commit three violent felonies, you go to jail without parole. A substantial amount of money to, to build new prisons. I mean, this is a tough bill. Now, the objections raised by some members on the other side go to the prevention provisions. And I have taken the time, and I assume that members on the other side of the aisle have done similar things, but I personally have taken the time to go visit with police officers in my district, chiefs of police in my district, uh, and sit down with them uh, across the table and say, what, what's the problem right now? What are your concerns? And what police officers in my district in Texas have told me is that the difference between crime today and 10 years ago is the amount of crime being committed by 13, 14, and 15-year-olds, the violent crimes being committed by young people in this country. And what the prevention provisions in this bill do is to try and address that problem that we face right now as a nation, that we have very young individuals, barely out of childhood, who are committing murder, and other violent crimes. And I, as one member of Congress, want to see us do something about that. Now, maybe all these programs won't work. Some of them are going to work, and I hope most of them are going to work. But we have to act. We have to act in both ways, both in terms of tough measures prov providing for additional penalties and measures to provide pre pre for prevention. And if we only address the penalty side and fail to address the prevention side, we will be ignoring one of the major problems in this country. Now, I have no other comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of uh, statements here. We all hope very much that we can get at the root of this problem of uh, young offenders who are out there. But I had dinner uh, with the Los Angeles County Sheriff a couple of weeks ago and a number of officers. And they spoke very strongly against this bill, primarily because of the fact that they interpret it as little more than a perpetuation of the social welfare monies which have been out there for years and years and years. And I think, Martin, if we look at the issues which you raise, and very appropriately are of concern to every single one of us, I don't believe that the answer to those problems is more federal spending. One of the things that I've concluded is that the more and more we expect from government, the less and less we expect from ourselves. And I think that as we look at this whole issue, one of the things that should be done is we should look at the root of these problems. And I remember talking to uh, uh, Mr. Halverson, who's the chaplain in the Senate, about this issue, and he said that it stems really from a sense of alienation that so many people have. And alienation from their families has created many of the, gun, uh, the gang problems that are out there, because people find that camaraderie uh, in gangs and things. So I, I just don't see a government solution to this. Midnight basketball as a panacea to this problem, well, it's far from it from everything that I've observed. Why? Because we have, over the past several decades, been expending large sums of money on these kinds of things. And I was a couple of days ago on a, one of the programs, and uh, there was a very liberal professor who, frankly, would disagree with the crime bill for different reasons than I would, but he said that this is little more than a political grab bag in an attempt to try and gain political support. And now, we have not had a chance to look at this, uh, at this conference report, we all know. As Jerry said, it came to us at uh, just about an hour ago right now. And uh, I wonder if 
all of those programs that were incorporated in the original package are there. If $1.8 billion in basically open-ended spending is going to be provided to local governments. Uh, I, I assume that it, that it will, and that's one of the reasons that I'm strongly, strongly opposed to this legislation. I just think that it goes in the wrong direction. Obviously, we all want to deal with the issue of crime, and I believe that those on the other side do, but I think the question comes down to how do we responsibly do that, and uh, I think that we can do much better, and uh, as Mr. Solomon had said, it's really very unfortunate that you know, we get this report just a little while ago, and Butler has said that we've had it going, Mr. Quillen has said, for six years, but there's a heck of a lot more to what is in this bill from things that I have heard. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, and uh, that's going to lead me to oppose it, too. Well, the gentleman yield. Happy to yield. I just wanted to follow up on the comments that I made earlier. I represent the center city sections of Fort Worth, as well as some of the center city of Dallas. And we have very serious gang problems in those two cities. And some of the programs that have been undertaken by our cities have made a start. Uh, the Weed and Seed Initiative in the city of Fort Worth has been one of the most successful programs in the country. The Attorney General visited that program in January. I had the chance to escort her uh, through my district and uh, talk to police officers and talk to residents. And those kind of programs do work. Now, maybe not everything in this bill is going to work, but I, I just want to reiterate that we can't walk away from the problems involving 13, 14, well, and 15-year-old violent offenders. Well, I don't think we are walking offenders. away from these at all, Martin. And I, I think that I don't need to go through the litany of problems that I have in my county of Los Angeles. I think that the world is well aware of the problems that exist out there with gangs and a wide range of other uh, situations. We've gone through riots and, and uh, a lot of things. And when, you know, the, the sheriff who is literally on the front line there has indicated to me how strongly he feels about the need to move away from the federal government. You know, maybe these are, you, you've talked about how the, the Dallas has gotten involved in this. And I think that may be very appropriate for you all to deal with this at the local level. But when we've got the kinds of problems that we're looking at right now, uh, it, it strikes me that this is more of a feel-good thing than a do-good thing. It makes those of us in Congress feel like we're doing some good by taking federal tax dollars and expending them on a lot of these programs, and uh, I just think it's the wrong direction. Well, would would the gentleman yield? Uh, you know, my good friend Marty Frost uh, uh, brought up the question of who was for this bill and, and who was against it. And, uh, you know, that really will explain to you uh, what is in this bill. Because you have to ask yourself the question, why are liberals, why are liberals who oppose tough crime, individual crime amendments on the floor, why are they for this report? And conversely, why are conservatives who always vote for tough crime amendments or tough crime bills, why are they against this report? Well, the reason is that it's soft on crime and it, and it is larded with pork. That's why liberals are for the bill and conservatives are against it, regardless of what political party you belong to. The reason is it, it repeals mandatory minimum sentences. For people who commit crimes with guns, we're putting 10,000 of those people who committed a crime with a gun back out on the street, and we're taking guns away from law-abiding citizens. Uh, but even worse, it creates tens of thousands of new jobs. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? Tens of thousands of, of, of new social worker jobs. As a matter of fact, two new permanent social, social worker jobs for every temporary cop they're going to put on the street where the funding's going to run out in a couple of years and local governments are going to be saddled with it. You know, that explains what this bill is, right? Jerry, Thanks if, you would, if, you, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if David would yield further Happy just for just a moment. Uh, I know you don't mean to overly generalize and paint with too broad a brush, Jerry. No. There, are, there are people of good faith in both parties uh, who feel very strongly about the crime issue who have and who have supported very tough anti-crime measures. And for, 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 for you to suggest that, that, there are Demo that Democrats don't support, that there aren't Democratic members who have su consistently supported tough anti-crime measures is an, is an overly broad statement. No, Martin, if you would yield, I didn't say that at all. As a matter of fact, I was very careful to say that uh, there are a lot of good conservative Democrats, okay, who have voted for, for tough crime measures. 
individual bills, individual amendments. Well, would the gentleman yield liberals further? Liberals and conservatives. Well, I, if, I, if I can I'd be happy to expound, yield, my I, I would be. If, if, I, if you don't mind if I address the comments to, no, to right. Mr. Solomon. Not at all. Be my guest. And, I, and to, far the, to follow up on Martin's point, now, however you characterize it, I think it would be incorrect and inappropriate to make the statement that you did. Uh, first, people in the Congress tend to vote on every issue based upon the issue, and it's very difficult to generalize to begin with. And on this particular issue, I know just looking at the state of Missouri that we have some people who are oftentimes described as conservative members of Congress who find some very good parts of this bill and some members of your own party. Uh, from from uh, my neighboring state of Kansas who have indicated very recently, and they are oftentimes described as conservative, that they would support this bill for some of the very tough provisions that people who are oftentimes described as liberal have helped to get in this bill. I've been fighting for the armed career criminal provisions, what we're calling the uh, three strikes you're out provision now, since 1983 when a somewhat conservative president by the name of Ro uh, Ronald Reagan pocket vetoed this, that kind of legislation. Now, I think to, to sit here at this point in time and to try to mislead the American people and to suggest that liberals and Democrats are, are for crime or for, are against tough crime measures and only Republicans or conservatives are, are for, and for strong anti-crime measures is, is completely uh, out of bounds. We, we, the, the one thing that I think all of us can agree on is that we are searching for the best way to reduce crime in this country. There may be some very real differences of opinion as to how we go, to, go about it, but to impugn the motives and, and the intentions of other members of Congress is, I think, completely if I inappropriate. I my time on that, let me, let me no just way. respond by saying that I, I think we need to recognize that this liberal professor with whom I was uh, having this exchange on a radio program in Los Angeles a couple of days ago made it very clear that this was a political grab bag. Now, when he was referring to that, he said the nine billion dollars of what if we I, consider if I can just if, point if, to no, some if, of the what statistics said, in the bill that, that you're referring issue, to. He considered the pork in this program, we, the social we, we've welfare got a spending, three billion as the basis dollar crime from which bill. they would gain the support of liberals. That was the point that this professor was making, and I think that's what Jerry is trying to say, too. Well, it, Chairman, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Dreyer, you first referred to FBI Director's freeze statement in the uh, editorial page, and now you talk about this liberal professor. Uh, you know, what makes you think he knows any more than anybody else about this? Well, he was matter? an expert from Bold Hall Law School in Northern California, and he was just happened to be on this program. And so, I mean, his, this is what his analysis of the, uh, of the crime bill has been. I just was offering if, that. If he was from Harvard, would you pay the same attention? Oh, absolutely. To? Absolutely. I have very high regard with people from Mr. Dry, uh, Boston. Mr. Poignan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate being recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have... Uh, as I think many of my colleagues have visited our, their respective communities, I've ridden in police vehicles through Port Huron, Michigan, and witnessed the crime in that city that I represent. I've walked uh, neighborhoods in East Point, a city which I represent and grew up in, with the, with the citizens of that community on a neighborhood watch venture. Before I got into this business, I used to be a uh, probation officer. I worked with juvenile delinquents. And I have watched with horror over the years the increase in juvenile crime in this country and the lack of attention that's being paid to our young people. This is an important bill. Probably, if not the most important piece of legislation, we will do this, this Congress, certainly one of two. This bill is basically the same bill that we passed last year and which was filibustered in the United States Senate by the Republican Party for 16 months. This is the same bill in which we passed in April, virtually the same bill we passed in April that's been around for four months, which we hope we can move and finally get on the president's desk this week. The gentleman and my friend from Tennessee has said this has been in the hopper for six years. It's about time we did something about this crime epi ec epidemic in this country. This bill will do that. I regret that when people suggest uh, that when the people on the other side don't like a piece of legislation, they label it liberal versus conservative, or they label it as has just been labeled here this evening, socialism. 
They called Medicare socialism in 64. They called Social Security socialism in 1935. They're calling the health effort socialism today. This is not socialism. This is tackling a serious problem in our country today, and we ought to be serious about it, and we ought to get about the business of doing it. My friend, Mr. Solomon, suggested that all you have to do is look at who is for this bill and who is against this bill to know that this is not a good bill. Are you su suggesting by that statement, and I will yield to you when I finish my statement to answer it, that Mayor Reardon of Los Angeles, a Republican who supports this bill, is not in keeping with what is in the best interest of your party? Are you suggesting that Mayor Giuliani of New York, who is lobbying and supporting this bill, is a liberal or a socialist or is not keeping in the best interest of the Republican Party? There are people all across this country, including police officers, associations, people who work in crime prevention and law enforcement who are supporting this piece of legislation. And they're tired of the foot dragging. They're tired of the talk. They want action. I think it's instructive, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, to go over some of the f parts of this bill for for our colleagues, since they don't seem to understand what is in it. Maybe if we refresh their memories, they will understand why the American people want this bill passed and passed soon. 100,000 new police officers on the streets engaged in community policing. Tough punishments, like three strikes and you're out, the bill that the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Wheat, has championed for so long, as he stated in his comments. Eight billion for smart, effective prevention programs, like employment skills programs. The gentleman yield. Uh, not at this point. Okay. I will yield in a little bit. Uh, programs that deal with drug courts, uh, programs that deal with violence against women, a ban on assault weapons, attack on, ju on youth crime, including boot camps and drug courts, strong in initiatives, as I mentioned, to combat violence against women in our society that is all too rampant today. Mr. Chairman, in the, in, the, in the area of neighborhood watch, many of my colleagues know of these watches. There are people who wear orange hat patrols and they work in their communities. This is a very important part of this legislation. Also important is the D.A.R.E. program, which is a popular program throughout the country that teaches our kids about the dangers of drugs. It's a successful program, and this piece of legislation uh, enforces and uh, uh, beefs up that particular program. For those who live in rural areas, it establishes a program to aid uh, in fighting crime, including an anti-drug task force and training. It has drug courts, to in which integrates prosecution, treatment, testing, and punishment of drug offenders at state and local levels. And it has a reimbursement for people in Florida and Calif in Texas and in California for criminal aliens. And it assumes federal responsibility for the first time by providing $1.8 billion to state and local governments for the cost of incarcerating criminal aliens. It has border control, provides a billion to implement the immigration enforcement initiatives to control borders, to expedite the deportation of criminal aliens, and to eliminate asylum abuse. And it goes on and on and on. If you're interested in drunk driving, and I know many people in the country are, this will authorize grants to, to use to prosecute persons well driving while intoxicated. It has a drug treatment provision in here that, that, that tackles people with drug problems at the local level, juvenile as well as older criminals. And it deals with drug and gang prevention, allows grants to develop more effective programs to reduce juvenile gang participation and juvenile drug trafficking. It has, uh, if you're concerned about pornography, this piece of legislation deals with violence against children. It strengthens the federal penalties against people convicted of assaulting children 16 years of age and, and younger. It has a, a provision in here to deal with the victims of crime, permits victims of crime and sexual abuse to present information or make a statement at a defendant's sentencing. There are other important things like trying juveniles and adults uh, if they are engaged in crimes such as murder, assault, robbery, and rape. This is a good bill. A good bill. It creates a lot of jobs, by the way, while doing good things. It puts a lot of people to work in this country, and it tackles an issue that every poll that I have seen recently says it's the number one issue on the minds of the American public. Germany. So, Mr. Chairman, it, 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 we, we have dilly-dallied long enough. It's time we move this bill, 
And I believe that we will move it in a bipartisan way. We will probably get a dozen members of the other side joining us and bringing this bill up. I regret we don't get more, but we will get at least 12 or so people on the other side of the aisle who care about moving this issue forward and dealing with the crime in their communities. And I commend them for it, and I commend them for standing up to their leadership and, 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 and moving this legislation. Because they understand that if we're going to deal with pornography, if we're going to deal with violent crime, if we're going to deal with making sure we have the prisons available to incarcerate people, if we're going to deal against this epidemic of violence against women, if we're going to deal with the crime in our rural areas in our society today, if we're going to deal with our neighborhood problems by increasing our neighborhood watch program, if we're going to tackle the question of crime in the local communities by putting 100,000 police officers on the streets all over this country, not just in our large cities, then we have got to pass this bill. So I thank my colleagues for their patience, and I encourage every one of them to come aboard, join us, do something for America, do something for our neighborhoods, do something to get some sanity back into the streets so that we can deal with this epidemic that is really eating away the heart of our fabric of our society. David, uh, you mentioned uh, my name and asked a question. I will yield to my uh, friend from uh, New York, Mr. Solomon. Well, first of all, let me say to you and to my good friend Alan Weed and to every member, and uh, you know, we all come at this from, from different uh, viewpoints. Uh, liberals look at it a different way, conservatives do. Uh, certainly no one would, would impugn their motives or their reasoning. Uh, you are a, an extremely uh, sincere member of this Congress, as are every one of you over there on that side of the aisle. But uh, the truth, you asked me a couple of questions, and one was, uh, what did I think about the mayor of Los Angeles or other mayors? And the, the Republican truth, mayor of Los Angeles, Republican the Republican mayor, mayor of New York, yeah, endorsing this bill and wanting we, we, to move we've forward. Got, we've got to go on, and my, my good friend uh, Giuliani. But uh, most mayors want uh, this bill because it's got largesse in it for the big cities. And that's exactly. understandable. By the same token, well, it's got uh, you've got your conference of state legislators who are very much opposed to this bill mm -hmm. because they know that the funding is going to run out and they don't agree with that. And that's a mixture of liberals and conservatives too. But it goes a little bit uh, further than that. Uh, you know, you, Do you the chief you, of police want this bill? Uh, do the Police Officers they, Association they, of America they, want this I know this some bill? that do and some that don't. Let me, well, let me I didn't interrupt you. Right, let me I'm just uh, finish. You know, you read off some of the good things about the bill, and I don't agree that all of those were good, but some of them were, and I've got lists of them that says bad provisions on this card and good provisions on this side. But the truth of the matter is, and I didn't mention the word socialism, you did. No, I, I, no, I didn't mention it first, Mr. Quillen did. Well, I didn't, but uh, I mentioned social workers. And the truth of the matter is that all of these social workers, that are, uh, these jobs that are going to be created, this is just CETA all over again. I remember back in the late 60s, early 70s, I was a town uh, supervisor. It's called, it's a mayor, really, but, uh, and sat on the county board of supervisors. And I got the county to vote down the first CETA program that was offered to Warren County up in the Adirondacks. And uh, because we knew that those programs were going to fail miserably. And sure enough, that was the worst programs that this government, had, this federal government, has ever enacted. And everybody knows it, including everybody here at this table, that those CETA government-run programs were a total failure. We're going right back, and for every single police, temporary police jobs we're creating, and, and those funds are going to run out, and local governments are going to be saddled with it, and my small town of Queensbury or Glens Falls can't afford to pick up that tab later on, okay? But we're creating two social workers for every one of those temporary jobs, that is the wrong way to go. So it's a, it's a question of philosophy, and uh, you're entitled to your opinion, and, uh, and the conservatives are entitled to theirs. But that's why we oppose it. We would like to beat the rule. We would like to beat the bill, and then come back with that part of the bill that deals with being tough on crime. And then we could all pass it. So it's a question of how we come at it. Jerry, I appreciate it. I yield to my friend from uh, California, Mr. Oh, I, I thank my friend for yielding. And I, I just wanted to clarify, I guess I'd stepped out of the room when you mentioned my uh, very good friend Dick Reardon, the mayor of Los Angeles. And he did, in fact, call me and urge me to support this bill. He's I will say man. to me. He's a wise man. Well, he is a wise man. But the fact of the matter is he's a mayor who's dealing with the fiscal crisis that the second largest city in the country is facing, and they need dollars. Now, this bill has $1.8 billion dollars in what is basically a blank check for cities. And we've had the description read to us several times, providing them with an open-ended opportunity 
to expend those dollars. Well, now, maybe, on, that, maybe, on that point, if, and okay. I will yield further. Okay. You know, I, I find it uh, quite amazing that 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 that, it, that we're concerned about blank checks to cities. Uh, you know, where I come from, the people at the local level often know best about what is important for their communities and how best to run their communities and what their priorities should be. Well, and I would think condo. that, you know, I very fr frankly would think that that Mayor Reardon and Mayor Giuliani would find it very insulting to suggest that the only reason that they're for this bill is because it's got some extra jobs in it. They are concerned about fighting crime in their community. They see it every day. They live with it. While we're here in Washington, they're there on the front lines. They know that this bill will help fight that particular well, David, problem it's, that it's they face. David, it's very clear that we have a different perspective than you on this. From our side, we believe that we should allow the people in these cities to keep their money rather than funneling it through Washington to come back to deal with these issues. I mean, that's basically the mindset that we have. And providing them with $1.8 billion is, and I don't know exactly where that's going to come from, this trust fund that's been established. And it's going to come from very serious the elimination. Let me tell you, you asked, you asked where it's coming no, from. No, I didn't ask. I just said, well, I'm going to tell you. Uh -huh. I'll, you take my time back, I'll tell you, and then I'll yield back to you. It's coming from the reduction in the federal government of over 225,000 jobs yeah. well, that we, we are cutting. It will be ten times the, 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 the level of employment in the federal government will be the lowest since Kennedy with the reduction in these, in these, in these jobs at the federal level. And those funds are going to be used to deal with this crime problem. This That's where whole, it's coming from. It's the whole concept of revenue sharing that we're dealing with here, and I think it's a problem. Well, the well, only point that I wanted to raise here, David, is the fact that maybe you didn't hear the exchange that I had uh, earlier with Butler. We continue to talk about 100,000 police officers who are getting out onto the street when the fact of the matter is this bill provides $14,700 per cop. Now, the average cost for everything involved is $65,000 a year. And so we're, ho we're at best going to get one-fourth of this 100000 that we continue to talk about. And I think those are real dollars that we've got to look at. So I think that as well, we I, constantly I, hear 100000 100000 you've said it about four times. I don't accept the, the, that those figures. I think there will be communities but, who will be able to hire people at $14,700 for training at, and all the, the, beginning the things that are process. needed for let those me, let me police officers to let do their finish. job. There will be people who, there are communities across this country who will be able to hire police With officers at a starting level, not at this point, at a starting level which will approximate that as well as having some shared financing from the local and the state what, governments what to supplement that. Yield. And there will be 100,000 police officers. You know that. I know that. The bill that left the House here had 50,000 police officers. It was increased to 100,000 in the conference and there will be 100,000 police officers on the, the beat. Gentleman, yeah. I yield back the balance. Gentlemen's the time has no, expired. I mean, Mr. Chairman, he mentioned my name in his well, I would. I yield my friend, Mr. Quillen. You'd be more careful. I'm sorry, I, he yields to me, uh, Mr. Dreyer. Oh, no. I think you've had your time, no. Mr. Which section of this bill do you want to use, Mr. My Quiller? friend from well, Michigan. I you mentioned my well, name. I did. I didn't say socialism. I said social program, and that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I. I take exception to your connotation on my remarks. And I didn't say liberals or conservatives. I no, said I didn't the Democrats versus Republicans. I was referring now, to Mr. Solomon you, at that point. If you, I said that. If you consider yourself liberals, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't. Well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you feel like there is no socialism in this bill. And, and I, I think that correction. we all are Americans, and I think we ought to realize that we're fighting crime and not each other. Oh, well, the best way <laughs> to do I that is to move this bill forward. I disagree with the with the program that has been presented, yeah. and it's been on and off, on and off, on and off for six years. Can I ask you? We have a difference of opinion yeah. and an honest opinion, Mr. Chairman. Are you cutting me off? No, because I don't want to be criticized you for you, but I think we've been debating the bill here. I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, he mentioned my name, and I insist, if he yields, to he, continue he already, my time. He already apologized, Jim. Well, I, we don't need an apology. We're friends. 
All right. He's a great guy, but I just want to set the record straight that the crime bill, to me, stinks in many provisions, and that's the way I feel. Well, I understand. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Porter Goss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We've been talking about this bill. It's been lying around here for six years. I think that's a little hard to understand. I thought this was President Clinton's bill, and I, I don't know. He hadn't been here for six years. But going beyond that... Well, you'll that, have to fight with Mr. Quillen about no, that. No, I don't He's think I want to fight with Mr. Quillen about anything. But, I, but the, the fact of the matter is we're, not, we're talking about a conference report, and, and we didn't have the conference report when we had the hearing. And we've just barely gotten a conference report tonight. Not, any, not a person in this room has read that conference report. If, if they have, it's, it's a secret to me. And the fact of the matter is that uh, this really is too important to rush through, and I think we ought to know what's in the conference report. We took a lot of votes on the House floor to instruct conferees. I haven't any idea what's in or what's not in the conference report. When we asked Mr. Brooks what our points of order were going to be protecting, he said, well, I have a list, but you aren't going to see it. And I don't know what is going to be in this and what we're protecting and what's not. And now that's a fair question for me to raise. And I don't think anybody on your side of the aisle, looking across the aisle, can answer that question. Uh, is or is not the Lamar University $10 million grant in there? If so, why is it in there? What section is it under? How many more other $10 million Lamar University? I don't even know where Lamar University is, but I read about where? It's in Beaumont. Why? Well, is that in Texas? Okay. How many Lamar universities are there in the continental United States? I don't know. But I suspect we're going to find out when we read the bill. So I agree with my distinguished ranking member, Mr. Solomon. says, you know, we really ought to take the time to read the conference report. It's not the crime bill. It's the conference report we're talking about here. We got 900 pages. If somebody would like to tell us how it's changed since we had the hearing, that would be welcome information. We don't have that information. Somebody like to tell us what's in it on the basis of our uh, instructions of conference? That would be nice too. I think it's fair. What's changed since we haven't read it? Somebody ought to let us know. Okay. Now let's let's go on to some of the other questions that are out there that have been raised tonight. And I've got to admit I'm a little puzzled because I got uh, a copy of this Buffalo News today. And before I got the statement of the FBI director on his way back from the woodshed, and apparently that was this afternoon at about 4 o'clock when he said I was misquoted or whatever, he did say in the same Buffalo News... Gentlemen, Neil. Yes, of course. Do you have any information that he was taken to the woodshed as a result of that statement? I thought this was sent from the woodshed. I'm sorry, it was sent from the Department of Justice. I, I'm, I misspoke, apparently. Um, the FBI chief criticizes crime bill, but reading on, and I, I, I reflect that he may, uh, may want to clarify his remarks, which he did in this, in this letter, and I'm pleased we got it. But he went on further to say, he said that the mayors and the police chiefs he's talked to, uh, they say they're worried that the crime bill does not fully pay for their programs included, and that the funds for the new officers would be eliminated in a couple of years. Now, the chief of the FBI has said that. He's not the only person who said that. Mayors and police chiefs across this country are saying it, and they're saying it to us as members of Congress because I'm hearing it. We've had testimony from other members here. It's a legitimate concern. We're going to run out of money, and this 100,000 policemen on the street stuff that we keep hearing is largely myth. I wish it weren't so, but it is largely myth. It's a front-end load, and it's going to leave the taxpayers with a giant bill, and the mayors and the police chiefs are going to be the ones trying to explain why this crime bill that costs $33 billion, which is not funded, why this bill didn't solve the crime problem, and it's not going to do it. So I, I think that's a very fair statement. I'd be very happy to yield in a moment if somebody wants to talk about it a little more. We've ha had some conversation, not yet. We've talked a lot about all the wonderful stuff this is going to do. I've got to point out that since 1960, we've had $5 trillion spent on social programs in this country in the name of crime fighting. And at the same period, we've had a 500%, sadly, increase in violent crime. And yes, much of it is among the teenagers. Now, how do we get these teenagers to go participate in midnight basketball or go to the dance courses or the grooming courses or whatever it is? Wouldn't it be better to take the $9 billion and give it to the 6% of violent offenders out there that are presenting the great percentage of the repeat uh, felonious crime, give them the money and say, we'll give you the money if you won't commit the crime. That would be a direct payment, but it would probably work better. I can't guarantee they wouldn't buy an assault weapon or go out and buy an illegal substance with that money, but it would probably have a more beneficial effect than, the, than this uh, 
30 years, 34 years of five trillion bucks from the taxpayers, which has yielded us no good results. And I'm sorry to say that, but when I look and go down the list, and I will not read the whole list, uh, uh, Mr. Bonnier has given us some positive points. I agree with many of them. There is good stuff in this bill. Unfortunately, it's so larded up with fat that it's very hard to find the lean. Well, here we're talking about drug courts, 1.3 billion to private entities, benefits to criminals who are drug addicts. Benefits include child care, housing placement, job placement, vocational training, and health care. Here's an incentive to be a drug addict so you can get these benefits. We're trying to reform social welfare to get these kind of people off the dole. Here we're saying this is how you get the benefit. That's a crazy incentive. Youth employment skills, 650 million to test the proposition that crime can be reduced through a saturation jobs program. Great, we know how that's gonna get handled out. There's no evidence. That's 650 million we could be doing for getting tough with crime on penalties, building prisons, and locking up the criminals. This 6% are causing most of the problem. 630 million for, uh, to recipients chosen by the Secretary of HHS, including uh, for community-based organizations, including arts, crafts, dance programs, renovation facilities, purchase of sporting and recreational equipment and supplies. This means that you've got to be some kind of a uh, uh, under an umbrella of a, a, a crime a potential person to get these kinds of benefits. Again, wrong message. Hope in Youth, wonderful title. This is multi-issue forum of 20 million for public policy discussion. Now do you honestly believe that public policy discussion is going to stop the youthful crime in this country? I don't believe that. And I don't think any American really believes that either. Maybe there's a few social engineers up in some of those uh, establishments we hear about I, uh, up in the liberal northeast where I come from uh, that would promote that. Uh, I grew up there and I don't think even any of those folks are going to do that. Okay, we, we've talked about some of the, the serious problems. There's no habeas corpus in this thing at all. We're right back where we started from, whether it's been here six years or 60. We've got a serious problem there. Uh, when we go at the money, I'm serious when I say there's a shortfall. I am not making this up. There is a shortfall. There's 252,000 federal employees who may retire through attrition and we may get 22 billion and we have not funded the trust fund because it's titled in at 30.1 billion and then in the out years and another 13 billion to add on top of that and then there's a two point some billion to add on that which isn't funded in the program. Nobody has responded to my comments on that since the hearing. I have no idea if there's anything in that on the conference report. Fair question. Are the Americans getting hit for not only a 33 billion but a large part of that is is unfunded. Fair question. And I think you would agree on that. And again, I'm not making this stuff up. This is real. This is here. I would be very happy to yield to anybody who wants to answer any of that. I would ask the gentleman to yield. I would be delighted to yield the distinguished gentleman from Texas. We really have two levels of discussion here. One is whether we should bring this bill up at this time. And secondly, as to whether it's a good bill or not. Now, the minority has a motion to recommit to conference. If the minority feels strongly that this is not a good bill, then the minority has the right to offer a motion to recommit and may well prevail on the floor. If the minority is not successful in recommittal and the minority still feels that this is a bad bill, the minority has the right to vote against the, bill, vote against the conference report and may well, some, may, some Democrats may join in the minority in that. There's no assurance that this bill is going to pass. The question before this committee is whether this bill ought to be brought up or not. And, and, and I'm just suggesting to you that if you, if you feel strongly that there are bad features of this bill, uh, Mr. McCollum or your minority leader, whoever will exercise that right, will have the opportunity to single out those bad provisions and offer a motion with, uh, to uh, recommit to the conference with instructions to delete those provisions. So you have a remedy, and failing that, you have the remedy of voting against the entire bill. I thank the distinguished gentleman from Texas for reminding me of that, but I also have a responsibility here tonight as a member of the Rules Committee. And one of the things we're being asked to do is to waive points of order on a product that I do not know what the heck that means. Now, there are some pundits who are going to say we're going to have to use those 100,000 cops we're going to put on the street to round up the 10,000 drug addicts that we're going to let out of jail in this bill. That may or may not be a reasonable comment, and I agree that debate belongs on the floor. But I would very much like to know that every member of this body has the opportunity to sit down and read this and know what the points of our uh, points of order that are being waived are. That's a fair proposition, and I believe the gentleman from Texas would agree. What in the world are we protecting that otherwise we wouldn't that otherwise could be taken out on a point of order? 
I realize it's a conference report. I realize there are times when you have to protect things, and that is a, a judgment call. But I also believe if you don't know what those are, you're not doing your job as a responsible member of the Rules Committee. So I'd like to sit here and say, I'm not going to vote no until Chairman Brooks or somebody else tells me what we're protecting. I think that's a reasonable proposition. And if the gentleman would yield, we'll just point out one more time that Chairman Brooks sitting right there during the hearing refused to tell us, give us the specifics of what points of order were being waived. And he said further, if he did know, he wouldn't tell us, because then that would just wave a red flag. That is the wrong kind of an attitude. Now, Mr. Chairman, I think the operative question on this bill is not whether you vote for it or vote for it against the rule. The question is going to be, have you read the bill? And I think the more you read it, the less you like it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alan Weed of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in fact, uh, I started reading this bill very early this year. We started talking about it in uh, February. We talked about it in March. We voted on it in the House in April. It has been it voted on in the Senate. We've had it uh, in conference for a period of months. We all know what's in this bill. Uh, the gentleman from the other side referred to the fact that he hadn't been able to see the conference report earlier. He didn't know what was in it. And then read a litany of the things that he opposed in the bill. Now, I can understand the, the disagreement on the issues, but in fact, we all do know what's in this bill, and we've known for some period of time. Uh, you know, the suggestion that this rule is... It, the, 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 certainly. Would, you, uh, does, would the gentleman tell me whether those questions, those litanies that I read, are still in the bill or not? Because I don't know whether they are or not. Well, the gentleman's got a copy of the bill available to him right there. I'd suggest he take a look at it. And, he, he, and, and he's got as much time as he needs before this legislation comes up in order to take a look at it. It is uh, 9.15, as the gentleman it, it knows. It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was 8 o'clock when we started this evening. It was, we started on this a week ago. Uh, considering this very same legislation. And so, you know, I, I don't know what the gentleman's objection is to, to, is to considering this legislation other than the fact that he may have a disagreement about the legislation itself, and that seems to be what the, what the argument has been. Reclaiming my time, let me point out that this type of rule is not unusual at all. Uh, the Rules Committee staff handed out some information to me earlier this evening, and I think we all have it, that pointed out that we have adopted this very type of rule on conference committees 12 times already this year by voice vote, meaning no one on your side objected to it. We did it 33 times in the 102nd, 102nd Congress by voice vote or by unanimous consent. This is not controversial or, well, this time it does appear to be controversial, but it has in fact not been an unusual procedure in the past. In the, in the past, and it seems to me it is only the contentious nature of the fact that we disagree on this particular legislation that is creating the controversy over the rule. I can, I can, let, 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 let me finish my statement first. I can understand that we may have some disagreements on the bill itself, but as the gentleman from Texas pointed out, the appropriate place to deal with that is on the floor where we will all have time to, to deal with this legislation, and as we have dealt with this legislation on numerous occasions in the past. I fully intend to vote for this legislation. I think it is a very strong statement and will have a very strong effect against crime in this country. I think it has some very tough anti-crime uh, measures in it. 100,000 new police officers nationwide adding about 20% to the total of police officers in this nation. I know for my state that means 2,000 new police officers, half between the two major cities in the state. And by the way, we enjoy the misfortune and the, the, and the unfortunate distinction of being the only state in the nation with two cities in the top 10 in crime. I've talked to the police chiefs in St. Louis and Kansas City and the police chiefs and police officers around the state of Missouri. They all want the new police officers that they see in this bill. And I think that's going to help to reduce crime. They want the boot camps that are in this bill, so there will be a, a place to send juvenile first-time offenders so that we don't have to put them in prison for a first-time offense or, the, or so we don't have to ignore their first-time offenses. They want the money, they, they in fact want the money that's in this bill for prevention programs also. They said it doesn't do a lot of good to send a kid to a boot camp and then send them right back into the same kind of environment they came out of that produced their criminal behavior to begin with. And there ought to be some opportunity for the criminal justice system to have some kind of ongoing relationship with that kid that can hopefully keep them out of trouble in the future. I think we're making a valiant effort in this bill to do something about crime that people perceive as exploding in, in this nation. And I don't see how you can sit back and say, because 
because I disagree with one or two provisions in a $33 billion package that I'm going to vote against what could be the most serious effort to control crime in this country, at least in the 12 years that I have been in this Congress. I fully intend to support this legislation. I would encourage the gentleman on the other side of the aisle to do so, but if you don't, we both have a constituency to go back home to and answer to. I'm going to feel very comfortable with my answer. The gentleman yield. Yes, I'd be happy to I, yield. I thank my, my friend, friend for yielding, my, and I think that... Uh, Toward the close of your statement, you made it very clear. You said that the police officers and the chiefs and the uh, local officials want the money to do these things. And they, I think they, that, they, again, they, is they the very want, operative they word want here. The 2,000 police to, officers yeah. that will be in this bill well, for the state of Missouri, now you've, they, you've, they, you've they want Alan, the funds that, 2, that will be included for, poli for, for boot further, camps. I'd just like to make the point. I, I don't know if you heard in my exchange with Butler and then with David, I pointed to the fact that the average cost for a police officer is $65,000 a year. In this bill, $14,700. Well, I, 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 I don't know how much you pay in California, but police officers in Missouri would love to be paid at that time. No, 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 I didn't much say salary Michigan level, either. Alan. I didn't say salary level. I'm talking about everything that is necessary for them to do their jobs. And the fact well, of the matter well, is, as we look Mr. at that, Dreyer, that is an quite, average quite, cost that's out quite, there. You are, but the, first, I don't accept your numbers, but even if we were to assume the, that they were true, what you're suggesting is that you would rather do nothing I'm not than provide that, that kind of assistance to the local police authorities. The if, 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 I, the if I can reclaim my time, I think it's time that we, that we stop the rhetoric that we stop the debate, that we got onto the vote in this committee and we get onto the floor, we go down to the floor and make our individual votes of conscience on this matter and let the American people decide who's serious about doing something about But it's nothing but rhetoric crime. to claim that there are going to be 100,000 officers. My one question for you, Alan, that I'd like to ask, would the gentleman yield for just one question? Uh, I'd be happy to. I just wanted to ask, can you tell us, you said that we've all been able to see this 972-page bill or conference report. You know, I can you been, tell us what I, I haven't been. I haven't been interested in the specific provisions that you have been interested in. You look those up. But I know that 33, 30, 30, 30, 33 times in the 102nd Congress and, and already 12 times this year, we have adopted this very same kind of rule for conference committee reports. And it is your opposition to the legislation, not your opposition to the rule that's creating the problem But we this don't evening. often have the chairman of a committee come before us and say, even if I knew what the waivers were, I wouldn't tell you. And I, my question to you is, can you tell us what waivers are in here, what the points of order that could be raised uh, are let, let, that are let, being included. And uh, Mr. I, I, Goss I, I raised I hate to this, take uh, the, the lady's question, but, but she has given me some information which I didn't have before. And let me ask you in, on my time, if, if, if I may, where did you get this number for the average cost of the uh, number the for the average cost of $65,000... I mean, this is wasn't the same newspaper article that you used earlier to... to you mean the, the, sunrise, edition director, of the right. Buffalo New the right. sunrise edition of the Buffalo News this mm -hmm. morning that probably is the hometown paper of somewhere. It, it, it might, it might have been better information than what would be provided by the Heritage Foundation on this, mm -hmm. on this question, though. Uh, this information actually came from research that was done uh, by the Judiciary Committee. And, well, that's, uh, not, that's th not the number that was given by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, though, who did indicate that the, these police officers are funded, the, that, that we do have the funding level for 100,000 well, new police officers Well, this was provided to me by the Judiciary Committee, and frankly, well, the chairman has told us he wouldn't tell us what the waivers were, but even if, if he knew what they are, and so if, maybe if I, if we I got may, a figure that's not right I on may, target. Oh, I was just trying to ask you a question. If I may reclaim my time, the chairman did say that the, the 100,000 new police officers for the, for the nation were fully funded, and I know from talking to my police chiefs and fraternal order of police around the state of Missouri that they very clearly and definitely want the kind of support and the increase in officers that they can get from this bill, and that's why I intend Judiciary to support it. Judiciary Committee staff just said to me that it's a survey that was the comprised of the cities out of uh, from throughout the country. The uh, young uh, <laughs> <laughs> representative I from go that far. New York, But Ms. I Slaughter. certainly am glad you got to me before I got a whole lot older. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, since the House passed this bill in April, four months ago, uh, according to crime statistics, over 6,000 people have been shot and killed. Over 1,500 children were killed by guns. Over 32,000 women have been raped. And over 685,000 women have been battered by husbands or boyfriends, and some of them died. And while we dither and talk here tonight, these statistics climb, and these are the kinds of things that scare parents to death every time a child leaves the house. And obviously, whatever we're going to do about this, we're not going to solve it by the kind of discourse that we've had here this evening. 
But the nation spends $1.4 billion now to treat gunshot wounds. And in the state of New York, the largest cause of death by an accident is gunshots, surpassing automobile accidents. And if this trend continues by the end of the century, that will be the case nationwide. I really hope I can move the previous question or whatever procedural thing we can do here to bring this to a merciful close and have a vote so that we can get this down to the floor and have some hope of trying to stop some of this carnage. Thank you, sir. Ms. Slaughter, I think this is one of the bills that <coughs> everything has to be said by everyone. <coughs> and I think that's why uh, we're spending so much time here. Uh, okay, I'll time uh, conclude. Uh, Mr. 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 You're going to, to, you're going to, okay. to his. You make yeah. Right. The uh, chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule waiving all points of order against the conference report and against its consideration. The conference report shall be considered as read. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, I have a motion which I think is before each of you. Uh, the motion simply strikes the sentence which reads, all points of order against the conference report and against its consideration are waived. Uh, might I just briefly explain it to you? Surely. Thank you, sir. The, uh, the amendment would strike the provision in the rule that waives all points of order against the conference report. It would simply allow for the consideration of this conference report after it has been made available to all members for three days. And it would also uh, uh, strike the report and dispense with its reading portion so that members would know what we have here. And again, I won't uh, uh, debate this at length. The point has been made many, many times here tonight that members just do not know what is beyond scope in this bill. We don't know what was taken out. We don't know what was put in. That is not fair to the membership. Uh, keep in mind that the debate on this conference report, as all conference reports, is limited to just one hour. Now that means that we could lay this over until Monday or until Tuesday morning. We would simply take it up on the floor uh, after the uh, members have had a chance to look at it, staff has had a chance to analyze it, and the American people have had a chance. The press does not know what's in here, and the press is entitled to know. So, Alan, you know, uh, you, your points were well taken that uh, uh, we've debated this for months now, but the truth of the matter is, what is wrong with just allowing the three-day layover because we're not talking about getting a window of opportunity for, you know, four or five or ten hours of debate. We're talking about one hour on the floor. And that's all my amendment would do is to allow us to lay it over until Monday or Tuesday and then let the speaker call it up uh, whenever he cares to for just that one hour. That's a very reasonable request. And many members on your side of the aisle want this motion adopted. Well, a gentleman from New York... Uh is as knowledgeable about the rules as anybody at this table. Sure. And he knows very well that if we waive all points of order, that uh, somebody will make a point of uh, waive uh, the rules, and somebody will make a point of order, and uh, the bill will die because uh, because the uh, conference committee will. Just well, Mr. Dissolve. Chairman, uh, you you raise a good point, and you are you are more knowledgeable than any member of this committee. So let me uh, let me modify my my motion and just uh, strike the portion for the three-day layover. And we'll let all the other waivers there. But that means that we would have the opportunity to lay it over until Monday or Tuesday and let the, uh, let the membership have a chance to, to, uh, to analyze the bill. Now, that's a compromise on my part and our part. Uh, well, I think you ought to go along with it. Well, as you well know, I have, we have nothing to do with setting the time of debate. That's done by people in a higher pay grade than you or I. Well, why don't we get them on the phone? Uh, <laughs> well, they're on such a high pay grade, the phone is unlisted. <laughs> they don't answer the phone. <laughs> well, well, I wish we all could have gone home at a reasonable hour, but um, I think we understand my motion. Uh, yeah, question comes on the motion of on, the gentleman. Is it on my modified are. motion? Just on, waving on, the On your modified anyway. motion. Thank you. Question comes on the modified motion of the gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Oh. No. Oh, I think the ayes The no's it. appear to have it. The no's have it. Would I have a recorded vote? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonnier. No. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. 
Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Four members having voted in the affirmative, six in the negative, the motion of the gentleman from New York does not carry. The question now comes on the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. It seems like the ayes have it. The ayes uh, have I it. I think the it's in doubt. Uh, Could we have a recall, roll call vote? Sure. Sir? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Aye. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bonner. Aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Aye. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Solomon. No. Mr. Quillen. No. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Six members having voted in the affirmative, four in the negative. The motion of the gentleman from South Car Carolina is adopted in the rule. The rule will be carried by Mr. Derrick on the majority side. Mr. Chairman, since Mr. Goss was the last to speak tonight, he shall be the first to speak tomorrow, and I would, uh, he would carry for the Republicans. Okay. Well, uh, having no further business this evening, the committee... <laughs> the committee... Uh, adjourns and we'll be meeting at noon tomorrow. Okay. <laughs>The House Rules Committee went on Wednesday night to file the crime bill on the House floor. It's a $33 billion six-year plan. Among the provisions, money for new police and new prisons, and a ban on 19 so-called assault weapons. Today's House session will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 Pacific, and we'll have live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage on C-SPAN. Really Sunday on C-SPAN, a conversation with Governors Terry Branstead of Iowa, Tennessee Governor Ned McWhirter, and Christine Todd Whitman from New Jersey.